What you doing? Uh, looking for something. It's for a video. Oh. I'm going in. It's in here somewhere. Alright. What do we have here? Oh, nice. Alright. Yo, Sonic the... Wait, three? No. Six AA batteries? Oh, I have so many of these. Whoa. Uh, I can start exercising tomorrow. Oh. Did you find it? I think I just did. November 17th, 2012. Hey guys, we're here at the Nintendo World Store for Nintendo's Wii U launch event. Gamers were losing it over Nintendo's new console. Look at that cartwheel. They are excited. Oh my god. Is your body ready? See, we were hot off the heels of Nintendo's best-selling home console of all time, so the next generation had a lot to stack up to. While the Wii offered a beacon for family game nights on and off the couch, we would like to play. The Wii U promised a more individualized approach. This time, you were the focus. Forget Nintendo's family console. This one's about you, the core Nintendo gamer. The characters you love, the games you love to play in full HD for the first time ever, and with all the power in the palm of your hands, with the Wii U gamepad. With all the hype, a proven track record of success, and a unique new peripheral, looks like Nintendo might have struck gold again. Of course, 10 years down the line we know that's not the case. So, what did the Wii U set out to do? Is it worth checking out? And most importantly, what was it like to play one? Let me tell you about it. This is the Wii U. And boy has mine been through it. It's probably the least visually striking out of Nintendo's consoles, I mean next to the SNES and 64. This scene just kind of looks like a stripped down DVD player. And that plastic sure does show signs of wear. It comes with little stands that let it sit upright, but I don't have mine anymore, so use your imagination. The system boasted backwards compatibility with the Wii. That means you could play your old Wii games, use your Wii controllers, and even use the same cables on the Wii U. Honestly, one of my favorite features about the console. Of course, we're not just here to look at the console itself. Enter the Wii U gamepad, the true selling point of the system. It had all the features of a standard game controller. D-pad on the left, buttons on the right, analog sticks and triggers on each side, as well as some more specific features. On the top you had a volume control, AC adapter and a headphone jack, there was even a little slot to put your stylus in. Back on the front, there's a microphone at the bottom, a front-facing camera at the top, and of course, right in the middle, a 6.2-inch LCD touchscreen. This thing was beefy, and probably one of the main reasons why people were apprehensive about the console. I mean, look at it. You got a giant tablet as your controller. It looked clunky and uncomfortable. I didn't even think I'm going to like half these features. It seemed like Nintendo was dead set on putting a microphone on any system they could. And the front camera was, I don't know, good for video calls, I guess. But once you've got it in your hands, it's pretty nice. It's got a good weight to it, doesn't feel cheap, surprisingly comfortable to hold, and leave it to Nintendo to make some satisfyingly responsive buttons. All in all, it was just a solid controller, and the extra features served as an exciting bonus. Maybe the microphone will be good this time. Still not sure about the camera, but a full-size touchscreen on a controller? Think of the possibilities. It could be a drawing tablet, first-person views, asynchronous multiplayer, you could go into your inventory without pausing and shalala, it's gonna be awesome, right? Right? Let's find out. What's a console without its games? Let's boot this up and see what it has to offer. One cool thing we can check out before even turning on the console. You can use the gamepad to turn on your TV. I mean, not too useful since you usually have your remote around anyway, but it's always nice to see when consoles do something other than games. And one more cool feature. If you press the power button on the gamepad, it brings up your recently played games so you can jump right back into the action. Already scoring some points and the console's not even on yet. Let's check out the main menu before we get into games. All oh, right, I can't select anything. Uh, oh, that's right, the gamepad. So, the gamepad was the hub for the main menu. It already looks a lot like the Wii, a bunch of little tiles to pick what games to load. And Nintendo was pretty ambitious giving me this much space for software, I barely filled one page. But, since the Wii, they have given us a lot of other things to do before getting into games. 
If you look at the TV screen, you can see a plaza that used to be alive with the buzz of the Miiverse, which was Nintendo's attempt at a social media service. People could share posts and drawings, oftentimes with unhinged results. Ever since the server shut down in 2017, not much going on here. Okay, we have to make a me. Oh wow, look at that. We're actually gonna get used out of the front camera. Okay, the eye colors always have a- oh god, no, we're gonna go with black. Hair color doesn't really matter, we're gonna go ahead and get rid of that right away. Alright, photo time. Time to make the me in my own beautiful image. Smile big. It'll have to do. Alright, what else do we have here? Oh, internet browser. Even the Switch doesn't have that. Now, this was a handy tool for sure. You could actually use it while games were running in the background. It still is a less than ideal way of browsing the internet. I guess, unless you're trying to have your whole family gather around the TV, but that's kind of weird. My favorite feature by far is the curtains. It covers up the TV while still allowing you to browse on the gamepad. And if you hold down the button that does the curtains, Well, that's fun. You could put anything behind those curtains. Fantastic. Here's a look at the soon dead Wii U eShop. I wonder what studios are still making stuff for a shop that's going to be gone in less than a year's time. Why do they include so many games you can't even play on the Wii U? If I want to buy a 3DS game, I'll just go to the 3DS eShop. The virtual console library is pretty nice though. It's the only place you can officially play DS Virtual Console titles. Yeah, that's right. Not even on the DSi or the 3DS can you play DS Virtual Console. The gamepad acts like the DS touchscreen. That just makes sense. It can get a bit weird sometimes having to juggle your focus between the TV and the gamepad. So it's nice that they give you different options for view. I didn't play any DS Virtual Console until I was researching for this video. And honestly, it kicks ass. This is a really good way to play DS games. It's a shame they only ported over 31 games. The Wii U eShop is also the only place you can play Game Boy Advance games on Virtual Console. I mean, that's sort of a lie. There technically is one other way to officially play GBA games on Virtual Console, but that's a story for another time. We got games to play. What better place to start than Nintendo's pride and joy? Their first party titles that were really meant to move units off the shelves. Of course, you got Mario and his crew front and center with New Super Mario Bros. U. This is a continuation of the new series of Mario games that started on the DS. If you ever played New Super Mario Bros. Wii, this is a lot of the same. What makes this game really stand out is Boost Mode. Where New Super Mario Bros. Wii introduced 4 player multiplayer, Boost Mode on the Wii U added a 5th player. But the 5th player wasn't running around the levels like everyone else, no no no. They were the one that decided the fate of the others. Using the gamepad, player 5 was able to place down platforms at will by touching the screen. What you do with that power is up to you to decide. We're on the same team! This mode was a blast, and really made the game worth getting in my opinion. It's a shame this wasn't included in the Switch port for obvious reasons, but it does bear mention that this game was ported to the Switch, since we haven't had an original 2D Mario game release since this one. Okay, Pikmin 3 was a fun one. Nintendo took a non-traditional approach to the real-time strategy genre with this series. Instead of pitting your army against another player's, your task went navigating your army of Pikmin, these little guys, through levels to collect various fruits and mysterious technology. You can tell by the third entry in the franchise that they really nailed down a good formula here. I think this is a great example of a game that was made better by being on the Wii U. You could use the gamepad touchscreen to aim your Pikmin throws, and see a map so you can track down that last pesky Pikmin. Overall, a great game and a great use of the gamepad. This game was also later ported to the Switch. You might start to notice a theme here. But in terms of a true sequel, Fans are still waiting. Mario Kart! Eight. Yes, that Mario Kart. The only Mario Kart, or at least that's how it seems nowadays. What can I say, except it's Mario Kart and it's good as hell. This game's gimmick is anti-gravity, which honestly doesn't change too much as far as gameplay goes. This is just a solid core Mario Kart experience. It's no wonder that, you guessed it, it was ported to the Switch with Nintendo foregoing making a new mainline entry in the series since the original Wii U release. So get used to this one, because it's the only one we're going to have for a while.
For franchises that do get new installments, we have Smash Bros. This one kinda didn't have a name besides Smash Bros since the official title was Super Smash Bros for the Wii U to parallel the simultaneous release of Smash for the 3DS, which was the first time that the series was on a handheld system. Fans of the series just call this one Smash 4, since it's the fourth installment. Not much to say about the gameplay here except that it's a Smash game, classic platform fighter that we know and love, but I have to say one of my favorite parts about this game is 8 player local multiplayer. Good luck fitting 8 friends on one couch, or fighting 8 friends all together. But if you pass those initial hurdles, here are some of the ways you can give control to 8 people on one console at the same time. Wii Remotes, with or without nunchucks, Wii U Pro Controller, the gamepad, which also gave you a view of the action in the palm of your hands, a 3DS with Smash Bros could actually act as a controller for the Wii U, now that's cool. Unfortunately, the screen doesn't show any gameplay, but you can still get some cool UI. GameCube controllers using the coveted GameCube controller adapter. I don't even have a first party one. These things flew off the shelves and to this day are a pain to find. And pretty much any other official controller you can think of. You're gonna need them. I had a blast getting all my roommates and friends together in college for an 8 person free for all to determine who was really the best at Smash. Once Smash Ultimate released on the Switch, Smash 4 pretty much fell into obscurity. No real need for a Switch port when you have a new game in the series. Here's one that was ported to the Wii U. I bet you didn't see that one coming. Legend of Zelda Wind Waker HD was the premier bundle title for the Wii U. Instead of just coming with the game, the console itself had unique stylings, as you've seen throughout the video. It even came with a digital copy of the Hyrule Historia, a Legend of Zelda history book that notably laid out the Zelda timeline for the first time ever. Gameplay-wise, Wind Waker wasn't just ported one-to-one. -one. This version came with a slew of upgrades, including gamepad support, new gameplay elements, and of course, updated graphics. This is another game that made great use of the gamepad. Using the screen to chart your course while sailing without needing to pause is invaluable. Wind Waker HD has not been ported to the Switch. That kind of makes sense though, since it was already a port to begin with, and it was mostly just a way to get people that were on the fence to buy a Wii U to get the bundle. Besides, I'm sure we got other Zelda games to check out. Let's check out the series' big hit on the Wii U. Wait, this is a Switch game. Okay, I guess it did release on the Wii U, but that was on the same day as the Switch launch. And the Wii U version didn't even have anything special like gamepad support, even though they showed that it would multiple times. Okay, what about that trailer we saw during the reveal? Remember, back up the video. Yeah, that one. Well, that wasn't actually a trailer. That was just a tech demo. That Zelda game doesn't exist. Okay, what else do we have here? Hyrule Warriors? I mean, it's good, but where's the mainline title? Okay, how about 3D Mario? The Wii gave us Super Mario Galaxy 1 and 2, and the Switch has Odyssey. So, what do we have on the Wii U? No, not 3D like that. Okay, I'm noticing a bit of a crater when it comes to content on the system. That's okay though. We've got some classic IPs that are going to come to the rescue. Pokemon games for the Wii U included? Pokin. I don't know what I was expecting. Donkey Kong Country Returns got a sequel and that was really good, but I feel like for every first party IP you have to sift through a pile of ports, re-releases, backwards compatibility, virtual consoles, we wear. We need some heavy hitters! And if it's not coming from old IPs, well, it's gonna have to come from something new. At least your lot still knows how to make it in. Okay, this is not Nintendo. Oh wait, it is! And the story of how it came to be is actually pretty interesting. So this is Bayonetta 2, and after its prequel, Bayonetta 1, was met with such great reception, fans were clamoring for another installment. Unfortunately, following a restructuring at the game's publisher, Sega, Bayonetta was slated to not receive a sequel. That was until the developers of Platinum Games partnered with Nintendo. With such a massive company backing as the publisher, the series had a certain future, and Bayonetta 2 was announced as a Wii U exclusive. At the time, this was unprecedented. A game this sexy on a Nintendo console? Surely there must be a catch. 
Skeptics claimed that the game would be stripped down, or, well, tamed, to meet Nintendo's strict guidelines. But, funny enough, the opposite was true. For example, as an homage to Nintendo's role in Bayonetta 2, developers pitched to include Nintendo-themed costumes in the game. When shown concept sketches of Bayonetta's Link costume, Nintendo reps suggested changes, not to make things more family-friendly. No, instead, they suggested the costumes show more skin to fit Bayonetta's style. That's right, Nintendo said she wasn't sexy enough. The game even saw advertisement in Playboy magazine with the model cosplaying as the game's titular character. Sexiness aside, this is a good-ass game. It's got the hack-and-slash style of other Platinum Games titles like Devil May Cry, with an emphasis on stringing together combos while switching between weapons, dashing around, and using her signature Witch Time to slow down enemies and go for some crazy finishers. This game is over the top and off the rails in some of the best ways possible. I always love a piece of media that doesn't take itself too seriously, and Bayonetta is a perfect mix of satirical levels of absurd while still creating a gritty and dramatic stage for a witch to fight her way through angels and demons. While the game doesn't feature much gamepad support, probably due to the project not originally being conceived as a Wii U exclusive, I still think it stands as one of the Wii U's defining games. Bayonetta is now an iconic character that most likely would not exist as she does today without the Wii U. It gave a home for Bayonetta 2, along with the release of Bayonetta 1 that came with the game, and another one of Platinum Games' hallmark titles. The alien invasion of Earth will be met by a group of fearless warriors that number just 100 souls. 100 wonderful defenders of our world. Their faces are forever masked. Their tombs are forever unknown. They are... The Wonderful... I knew we forgot someone. You. Now, I'm going to be honest with y'all. I love this game. Danger's coming. Looming large, so who's going to make a stand? If you want to talk cheesy, over-the-top, mind-blowing fun, let's talk about the wonderful 101. You had the wonderful 100, a team of 100 heroes tasked with saving Earth from an interstellar threat. And what better way for 100 heroes to work together than to literally band together to fight? Use the gamepad to draw shapes of weapons, and the heroes get into formation to create that weapon. The bigger you draw, the bigger your weapon is. On your journey, you recruit leagues of heroes and civilians alike, including the game's shining cast and main characters. And boy, are these characters overflowing with personality. I'm the special combat agent, Sentinel's Planetary Secret Service, Blossom City Field Office, also known as Wonder Bread. The world, the enemies, the story, all of it is just out of this world. This game is a treat, and in my opinion, one of the absolute gems of the Wii U. I would not be able to do justice to explaining the experience of joining the 100 in this video. I suggest you check out the game yourself. Don't worry if you're not one of the few dozen of us who bought a Wii U. A successful Kickstarter campaign put a remastered version of this game on the Switch. Leave it to Platinum Games to work around a lack of publishing support. Now far be it for me to only talk about games from one studio, there's still one more title that I'd be a fool not to talk about. Okay, one more confession to make. I've never played a Xenoblade game, but I think that goes to show how influential the series is that I'm putting it in this video. Fantastic theming of an alien world and beautiful landscapes bring a vast open world to discover. This is one of the Wii U's definitive RPGs, and even one of its best open world games. This is the second Xenoblade game following the original on the Wii, and with how well this game was received, it's obvious that it played a great role in keeping the series relevant today. With the original getting a definitive edition on the Switch, fans are hopeful that X will receive a port any day now. So where does this all leave the Wii U? A now forgotten console, condemned by its underperformance to its predecessors, now only survived by the hidden gems it brought us, and the ports and remakes Nintendo sees fit to bring us again. While the Wii U didn't have a monumental impact on video games like the Wii or DS did, I don't think its commercial failure defines what the console was and continues to be. I think the Wii U was a space where developers got to cultivate ideas that would push gaming into a new age of prosperity. While we see the explosive popularity and progression of games today, we can know that the rumblings of that movement happened on the Wii U. I'm happy with what the Wii U brought, and I'm happy to keep playing it. I look forward to what the future brings for it, but for now, it has a place in my collection and in my memories.
Y'all, I hope you enjoy the video. I actually haven't seen the finished product yet. It's exporting as I speak, but I wanted to say thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. I had a lot of fun putting this video together. I'm really happy to finally put it out and I'm excited to put out more videos in the future. If you want to be there for those videos, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Leave a like if you want to help out my reach, help me tell my stories to more people. And leave a comment as well. Really leave a comment. I want to hear about y'all's experience with the Wii U or just with gaming in general. I'm going to be reading every single comment. I hope to see y'all for the next video. Until then, take care. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.